This is part two of the lecture on imaging of the nasopharynx. Okay, that's primary disease. Now let's look at nodal disease. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. N0, no nodal disease. That's, uh, that's classic. N1 is unilateral disease, but there's an exception. Retropharyngeal lymph nodes are extremely commonly involved in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Those should go together in your mind. If you see retropharyngeal nodes and you have not found a primary tumor, look at the nasopharynx because retropharyngeal nodes and nasopharyngeal carcinoma should go together closely in your mind. Retropharyngeal nodes are so closely associated with nasopharyngeal carcinoma that even contralateral retropharyngeal nodes still count as N1 disease. So N1 is unilateral disease, allowing for contralateral retropharyngeal nodes. N2 disease is bilateral, again, not counting that retropharyngeal stuff. N2 is bilateral disease. N3 disease is when you have a nodal cluster that's greater than six centimeters, just like the rest of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Or if nodal disease extends below the cricoid, it's very unusual for nasopharyngeal carcinoma to extend into the lower neck. So if you have a lymph node that's below the lower edge of the cricoid cartilage, that gets you to N3 in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Let's show some examples. Here's N1 disease. This is a patient with unilateral disease. Obviously, it has to be on the same side as the uh, primary tumor. Unilateral, um, ipsilateral disease uh, within levels uh, within level two of the right neck. N1 disease. What about this one? Well, even if the um, the, the primary tumor is on the left. This is a retropharyngeal lymph node, and so it's always going to be N1 disease regardless of which side the primary tumor is on. Here's another example, um, bilateral retropharyngeal lymphadenopathy. So we've got bilateral disease here, but retropharyngeal nodes are the exception, still N1 disease. Okay, now we've got bilateral disease not uh, outside the retropharyngeal nodes. This is where we get to end. How about this node? We're pretty far down in the neck here, aren't we? We're, um, we're looking low in the neck. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma doesn't usually go low in the neck. But are we really that low? Well, here is the thyroid cartilage. There's the cricoid cartilage. We're not below the inferior margin of the cricoid cartilage. We're just at the cricoid cartilage. So this is still N1 or N2 disease. Um, I'm showing you unilateral, so N1 disease, um, but it's not N3 yet. N3, you need to be below the, the, the larynx, below the inferior margin of the cricoid cartilage. Here is thyroid gland. We're below the level of the larynx. That lymph node is going to be uh, in, indicative of N3 disease because it's so low down in the neck. Let's take a moment to discuss unknown primary tumors. An unknown primary tumor occurs when squamous cell carcinoma is identified in a lymph node under fine needle aspiration or uh, excisional biopsy. And we know that uh, squamous cell carcinoma doesn't arise in lymph nodes. It had to come from the mucosa somewhere, but we don't know where. We do a clinical examination. We do pan endoscopy. We do a CT. None of those identify where that primary tumor is located. Now it's called an unknown primary tumor. If the nodal tumor, if the disease in the node is positive for Epstein-Barr virus, we assume that the primary tumor came from the nasopharynx. And this is how you get that T0 tumor that I alluded to earlier, is when you get an Epstein-Barr positive lymph node with no known primary tumor, that's what we call a T0 nasopharyngeal carcinoma. A couple of words on the changes that have recently occurred when we went from AJCC7 to AJCC8. We have downgraded pterygoid and prevertebral muscles to T2. We use more precise terminology for what we mean in those locations. Um, we have changed to the terminology caudal border of the cricoid cartilage, which we've discussed. And um, there used to be 3A and 3B. Now we just lump those into uh, N3 disease for nodal disease. So if I can uh, show that to you graphically, this is a diagram that comes straight out of the AJCC manual. 
showing the differences between the older 7th edition and the newer 8th edition. You can see that T2 disease now encompasses the uh, medial and lateral pterygoid muscles and the prevertebral muscles, uh, more clearly uh, delineating those, and, and all of that occurs at the expense of, um, uh, of T4, although that now extends back to include the parotid gland. The rest of this lecture is going to be devoted to other diseases that look like nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So we'll cover infection, inflammation, benign and malignant tumors other than NPC that occur in the nasopharynx, and simple cysts like mucus retention cysts and torn wall cysts that uh, can look like NPC uh, to the unwary radiologist. This looks like nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It's extensively enhancing. It's very aggressive. It's coming through the clivus. It's, it's coming into the carotid space. It's headed out laterally. This looks just like nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This is skull base osteomyelitis. Particularly in elderly individuals, nasopharyngeal carcinoma and skull base osteomyelitis look identical. You always have to consider both in the differential together uh, until you have tissue sampling. This is a classic mimic and a classic mistake to make to call a skull base osteomyelitis nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Here's another mimic. This mass is filling the nasopharynx uh, somewhat symmetrically on both sides, but it's pretty much confined to the nasopharynx. So, you know, T1 nasopharyngeal carcinoma. No, this is a mimic. This is inflammatory disease. Wegner's granulomatosis looking just like nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This image looks just like that picture of T4 nasopharyngeal carcinoma that I showed you. Maybe a little more uniform enhancement, but it's still got that extensive involvement of the cavernous sinuses surrounding the carotid arteries, breaching back into the posterior fossa. This is, in fact, a pituitary adenoma, an aggressive pituitary adenoma that has extended up and, uh, and outward looks just like nasopharyngeal carcinoma, but this came from the pituitary gland. One of the more common masses that we identify in the nasopharynx doesn't actually arise in the nasopharynx. It arises in the maxillary sinus, or antrum, and then it extends out. It, it bulges its way out into the nasal cavity, and from there extends posteriorly and breaches through the coena, which is the border between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx, breaches through the coena and ends up in the nasopharynx and ends up being a secondary nasopharyngeal mass. Um, one could imagine this being mistaken for some uh, mass arising in the nasopharynx and extending forward into the nasal cavity. We call, these are inflammatory polyps, and when they extend from the antrum into the nasal cavity, we call them antranasal polyps. When they extend from the antrum through the nasal cavity and across the coin into the nasopharynx, we call them antrochoanal polyps. Here's, a, uh, here's an example. Uh, nasopharyngeal carcinomas don't usually calcify, so this is not as good a mimic as some of the other ones that I was showing you, but it is a mass filling the nasopharynx. This one is has coarse calcifications uh, and an internal matrix, and it's exophytic. This is a hamartoma, a, a, a sinonasal hamartoma that is extending posteriorly and filling the nasopharynx, much the way an antroquinal polyp would do so. Here's an example of a mass that is filling the nasopharynx and extending forward into the nasal cavity. And you might look at this and think, ah, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, it's still uh, T1 disease because we allow for it to extend into the nasal cavity. Well, this is a, actually less destructive than you might imagine. It's very well behaved for the size of the lesion, and that's because it's not nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This is lymphoma arising in the adenoids and filling up the nasopharynx. So lymphoma, another potential mimic. Well, this one's a little more aggressive. Uh, this one has erosion of the underlying bone, and it's maybe extending into lacerum and uh, eroding the, the pterygoid plates. Very aggressive appearance to this, to this lesion. Um, but it's right where we expect nasopharyngeal carcinoma to be. The problem is that this is actually adenoid cystic carcinoma arising from the mucosal surfaces of the nasopharynx. We know that adenoid cystic carcinoma, like any minor salivary tumor, can arise on any mucosal surface, including the mucosal surfaces of the nasopharynx.
This one doesn't look too aggressive. Um, it has sort of this balloon shaped uh, appearance where there is a tail extending out laterally. And where's that tail extending? Well, that tail is extending right into the fossa of Rosa Mueller. And then from there, it's ballooning out into the nasopharynx. Now, I did say that nasopharyngeal carcinoma frequently arises in the fossa of Rosenmuller, fossa of Rosenmuller. so you do want to suspect that disease in that location. But look how well defined this is. Look how uniform it's and bright its T2 signal is. Look at its nicely formed walls. That's because this is actually a mucus retention cyst. And the fossa of Rosenmuller is also a common location for mucus retention cysts. This configuration of a balloon with a little tail coming off to the side there, absolutely classic for a mucus retention cyst of the frost of Rosenmuller. This is actually a very common incidental finding. If you look for it, you'll see it all the time. This is a classic appearance of a cystic rounded lesion right in the center of the nasopharynx. This is a Tornwald cyst. It's an embryologic remnant of the uh, associated with the notochord, not of the notochord, but associated with the notochord. And uh, how do we distinguish this from mucus retention cyst? Well, by location. I'm sure that I have called plenty of midline mucus retention cysts, Tornwald cysts, and since they're both almost always incidental findings, I don't think I've done anyone any harm. In closing, I want to emphasize one particular point about imaging the nasopharynx, and that's mastoid effusions. Whenever you see a mastoid effusion and you don't have a good explanation for why that patient has a mastoid effusion, turn your attention to the nasopharynx. I can't tell you how frequently I have found an unsuspected nasopharyngeal mass just based on the identification of uh, a, um, a mastoid effusion. Um, these two things should be closely associated in your mind. What's happening here is that the nasopharyngeal mass is obstructing the eustachian tube and uh, as it encompasses the opening in the nasopharynx and that obstruction is resulting in a mastoid effusion. When you see a mastoid effusion, look for the nasopharyngeal mass. That concludes our lecture on imaging of the nasopharynx with a focus on nasopharyngeal carcinoma and then a review of a variety of other lesions in the differential diagnosis.